I'm Barry. You and I are about to do something that many people only dream of. Today, I'll be your instructor as you fly this airplane for your first flying lesson. Today, we're going to make a short flight from San Diego, California to the famous Airport in the Sky on Catalina Island. It's about 26 miles off the coast, and I'm going to put you in the pilot seat of this Cessna 172 Skyhawk. Now it's a typical four seat single engine airplane used for flight training at flight schools everywhere. This is a new airplane and it has what we call a glass instrument panel. And I'll show you more about that a little bit later. Now when you go out to your airport to continue your flying lessons, you might be using a completely different kind of training airplane. And that's just fine because the type of airplane you train in is not as important as the skills you'll learn. Most training aircraft all handle about the same and have similar controls and flying qualities. So what you learn today will apply to your trainer. Now, before you fly any airplane, you should always conduct a careful pre-flight inspection of that airplane. And your instructor will show you how to do that for your specific airplane. So let's take a look at how the controls work from outside the airplane so that you'll know what's going on when we get in the air. And let's start with the tail. Now here we are at the tail of the airplane, and this is what we call the horizontal stabilizer. And you'll notice that there's two parts in this Cessna. The front half, which doesn't move, and the back half that goes up and down. And we call this movable part the elevator, because it's used to climb and descend. And an easy way to remember that is if you pull back on the wheel toward you, you're also pulling the nose up or towards you. Push the wheel away from you, and you're also pushing the nose away from you or down. Now this little surface here is called the trim tab. Its job is to hold the elevator in position so you don't have to. Now you control it from the pilot seat so you can fly the airplane with your hands completely off the controls. Now of course none of this would matter if we couldn't keep the airplane in the air in the first place and that is the job of the wings. Now here you have the wings, and the wings create lift. Now lift is created as the wings slice through the air because of their shape that you can see right here. Now in flight, some of the air flows over this top curved surface while the rest flows along this flatter bottom surface. And curving the air over the top of the wing creates a low pressure area on top with normal pressure under the wing and it's that pressure differential that pushes up on the bottom of the wing. And there you have it, lift. But when you turn an airplane, you bank the wings and that tilts the lift in the direction you want to turn. And to put the airplane into a bank, you use the ailerons. Now the ailerons are these movable control surfaces at the back of each wing. Now, if you turn the wheel to the left, the left aileron moves up and the right aileron moves down. And that difference changes the lift on each wing and causes the airplane to bank to the left. Now you might be wondering, if we use the ailerons to turn the airplane, well then what's the rudder for? It turns out that when we bank the airplane, aerodynamic forces cause the nose of the airplane to want to go in the opposite direction of the turn. And we call that adverse yaw. So that's where the rudder comes in. Now here's the rudder, and what you use the rudder for is to keep the nose of the airplane from turning in the wrong direction during a turn. It's controlled by two floor-mounted rudder pedals. So if you want to turn to the left, you turn the control wheel to the left to bank the airplane, and at the same time, press the left rudder pedal. An easy way to remember that is just press the rudder pedal in whatever direction you want to go. It's easy as that. Now there's one more thing the rudder's used for, and that's to correct for a natural left turning force on most propeller driven airplanes. And that force is stronger at slow speeds when you're using lots of power, like when you're climbing. And you compensate for it by applying right rudder, and you'll get lots of practice doing that. Now let's take a quick look at the flight deck of this airplane, so you'll know what you're looking at from the pilot seat. So this is what we call a glass instrument panel because you'll notice that there's two glass computer screens on the instrument panel. These displays show information to the pilot like airspeed, altitude, 
engine health, and a whole lot more. Now the airplane you fly might instead have a panel that looks more like this. These are traditional analog instruments and they present the same information to the pilot as the glass panel does. And neither has an effect on the performance of the airplane, how it handles, or what you'll need to learn to control the airplane. And switching from one to the other type, it's just a matter of a little practice. Well, I think we've looked at all the basics about this airplane for now. Now comes the fun part. Let's go flying. You know, every time I get in an airplane, I have that same sense of excitement I had when I first learned to fly. In fact, it's one of the few activities in my life that from the very start until today has maintained that same high level of excitement. So let's you and I go and fly this airplane. Now you've probably already noticed you're sitting in the left seat and that's because you're the pilot. The pilot always sits in the left seat. Now when you get into an airplane for the purpose of flying it, you always want to make sure that your seats are set to the right height and are comfortable and that the shoulder harness is comfortable and the seat belt is secure. Now one thing you'll want to do is make sure you can reach all of the controls comfortably. And we talked about the controls outside the aircraft so now let's talk about some of the controls and the instruments inside the aircraft. Now the control that's maybe the most fun is the throttle because it controls the engine. You push the throttle forward to get more power and you pull it back to get less power. You'll be using the throttle quite a bit during your lessons. Now this red knob right next to the throttle is called the mixture control and it controls how much fuel gets mixed with the air inside your engine. In a car, we don't think much about fuel-to-air mixture because cars are mostly at the same altitude. But in an airplane, as you fly higher, the air gets thinner. So we have to reduce the amount of fuel that gets mixed with that thinner air or we'd flood the engine. And that's why we call it the mixture control. So next, let's talk about some of the instruments on the panel. Now, as we discussed before, this is what we call a glass panel, and it uses these display screens to present information to the pilot. So let's take a look at some of the most common instruments on this display. Over here is the airspeed indicator, and it tells you how fast you're flying through the air. On this side is the altimeter, showing you how high you're flying. Now in the center is this large attitude indicator. Some pilots call this the artificial horizon. It displays the orientation of the airplane in relation to the horizon outside. And it shows the pilot if the airplane is nose up, nose down, or banking. And below that, you see your heading indicator. So you know what direction you're flying. It's like a compass. Now over here, the second display screen tells us everything about our engine. This display also shows a navigation map so we can see where we are at any time. And believe it or not, you'll get comfortable with all of this in no time. Now to communicate with air traffic control, we have two radios that we can use. And that's for redundancy. And the frequencies are displayed right here. There's also buttons that control our navigation system that we can use to select different display options. Now you'll notice that below the display panels are some backup round instruments. These can be used if an electrical problem prevents the digital displays from working normally. Now these switches control electrical power to the airplane and the avionics. And this set of knobs control lighting and other electrical components that you'll learn about. So that's it for a quick tour of the panel. The next step is to get ready to go flying by working with the radio and getting the engine started. Now, before we start the engine, we always listen to the recording of the airport information, and that's called ATIS, A-T-I-S. 
and it stands for Automatic Terminal Information Service. It tells us the weather conditions at the airport, including which runway to use, and all about the wind and clouds and other conditions that could affect us. So I'll turn on the Battery Master and the Avionics Master. And now let's tune to this airport's ATIS frequency and get all the information we need to know before we go fly. Mission Golf 2153 Zulu, wind 280 at 9er, visibility 10, clear, temperature 23, dew point 14, altimeter 290, 9 2, LS runway 2 way right approaching you, also landing in. Well, you just couldn't ask for better flying weather than that. So now, let's get the engine started. I'll do all the radio communications on this first flight, but later on, you'll do them yourself as you learn to fly the airplane. Now, to start the engine, we'll follow a checklist. You'll get really familiar with checklists in flying because we use them so we don't forget or overlook important steps. This is the engine start checklist for this airplane. Now I've already completed most of the checklist and we're ready to start the engine. Check and make sure that the area is clear. Clear! And let's start the engine. Now whenever you start an aircraft, you first want to make sure that the oil pressure is okay. The oil pressure is just fine. So now we'll turn the radios back on and get permission from the tower to taxi the airplane. Montgomery Ground, Skyhawk 201, Kilo Sierra is a Cessna 172 slant Gulf West Coast hangars. I'd like to request VFR flight following to Catalina at 4,500. We have information in Quebec and we're ready to taxi. Cessna 201, Kilo Sierra, Montgomery Ground, runway straight left, taxi via Hotel Bravo. Now Montgomery Field has two runways and they've cleared us the taxi to runway 28 left. So let's go ahead and do that. Now the first thing we want to do is check the area ahead of us. Make sure nobody's in our way and everything looks clear. So it sure looks clear to me, so let's go. I'm going to add just a little bit of power to get us rolling. Now we'll check the brakes. Eh, mine feel just about right. Now let's look around, make sure we're not going to hit anything. This is important to keep your eyes moving when you're taxiing. I'm steering the airplane with my feet, using the rudder pedals. And when you first learn to fly, it takes a little bit of practice to get used to the idea of steering with the rudder pedals, because the control wheel is not connected to the ground steering mechanism at all. Now steering with your feet is pretty natural once you do it a few times. You press the left rudder pedal, and the airplane turns to the left. You press the right rudder pedal, and the airplane turns to the right. Now you just have to fight that urge to turn the wheel or the yoke as the pilots call it. To use the brakes in most single engine trainers, you move your feet up a little bit to the top of the rudder pedals. Now the top of the rudder pedals control the brakes, and you have separate brakes for each wheel. So you can get in and out of tight parking spaces really easily. Now like everything else in flying, a little practice and you'll feel right at home in no time. Now you might be wondering how fast we taxi an airplane. Well, you taxi an airplane just about as fast as you can jog because you want to be able to stop quickly if you need to. All right, now we're coming up on the run-up area, which is a spot near the runway where we run up our engine and make sure all the systems are go. Now I'm pulling into the run-up area, again, using those rudder pedals and brakes. We'll follow this up now, uh, thank you, Victor. 96 pop off your basic 10 down. All right, now let's grab our checklist and we'll do our run up. Now, here in the run up area, we'll start by making sure our seat belts are on and our doors are latched, and we're all set. Now, we check our controls to make sure they move freely and correctly. Okay, they look great. Now, our fuel selector is set to both tanks, and our trim wheel is set to the takeoff position. Next, we'll do a magneto check, and magneto is just a fancy word for the device that controls our spark plugs in the engine. We have two independent sets for redundancy and safety, so I'll check those by running up the engine to high power and then checking each set of magnetos on its own. So here we go. One set. Check the other set. Look good. And now we just check to make sure all of our engine instruments are in the green which they are, so everything looks good. Now I'm setting the wing flaps down, and that'll give us a little bit of extra lift on takeoff. 
And looks like both flaps are good. So now because we'll be flying over water today, there's a few things we'll add to our checklist. Now first, we've got life vests on board, just in case we need them. And second, we've requested flight following from ATC. And that's an air traffic control service that adds radar tracking and traffic advisories. And it gives us someone to contact quickly in an emergency. Now our glass panel will show our navigation track out to the island and will also give us up to the minute weather advisories. And last, we've done an extra thorough pre-flight to make sure the airplane is in ideal condition for our trip. So now, we're ready for takeoff. This is 201 Kilo, Sierra West, on approved, runway 28 left, for takeoff. Here for takeoff, 28 left, 201 Kilo, Sierra. That's three number, I'm Charlie, uh, yep. be number three. Okay, now, right as we taxi toward the runway, we're going to check and make sure that the runway is completely clear. Uh, got, yeah. Now, the tower controllers have already done that, but we always double check. And that's important as a pilot to always check yourself to make sure that everything is clear and we're ready for takeoff. Now, I'm using the rudder pedals in order to line up with the runway. And as we line up with the runway, I'm going to add power now, and off we go. Now, quick check, make sure that we our engine instruments are good, and they are, oil pressure's good, everything's good. And using the rudder pedals now to steer right down the center line. And then a little bit of back pressure gets you in a climb attitude, and we are airborne. You know, it's a myth that it takes a lot of strength to fly an airplane. Actually, flying an airplane is a gentle process. It doesn't depend on strength at all. So as we fly toward the shore, I'm keeping a light touch on the control wheel and adjusting my nose position to maintain my airspeed. I'm also looking around for traffic. Now, one of the secrets to controlling an airplane is to just relax. Now we left Montgomery Airport, and right now we're flying pretty close to Miramar Marine Corps Air Station. It was once the famous home of the Top Gun Fighter Pilot School. Now we're avoiding their busy airspace while we're flying toward the shoreline, where we'll make a right turn to fly northwest along the coast for a little while. And that'll keep us close to land for as long as possible. And then, as we get closer, we'll turn out to sea towards Catalina Island. Well, we're getting ready to make that right turn, and it's just a beautiful day to fly. All right, let me start my right turn by checking for traffic, and let's talk our way through it. You turn an airplane by banking the wings that tilt the lift in the direction you want to turn. So I'll turn the control wheel to the right and press just enough right rudder to keep the nose from going in the wrong direction. Now you'll notice that the nose wants to come down a little bit because we're borrowing some lift from the wings to turn the airplane. So I'll add just a little bit of back pressure on the control wheel to keep the nose above the horizon. Okay, we're reaching the heading we want, so now we'll roll out of the bank by using left aileron and left rudder. The airplane rolls back to level. See, nothing to it. Now let's talk a little bit about climbing. Our nose position is still above the horizon, and we have full power, so we're climbing. Now once again, I'm controlling our climb speed by setting the position of the nose using the control wheel. And I've trimmed the airplane to hold that climb speed without me having to hold the wheel back. It makes the airplane really easy to fly. Now I'm holding a little bit of right rudder pressure in order to counteract the tendency for the airplane to want to turn to the left. Okay, we're coming up on our cruise altitude, so let's lower the nose just a little until it's slightly below the horizon, so we'll stop climbing. Now notice that the airplane picks up speed. Now I've left climb power on to let the airplane accelerate, and it'll pick up speed because the nose is slightly down, and when I get to cruise speed, which is about 105 to 110 knots, I'll slowly reduce power to the cruise setting. So now we're established in straight level flight. And it's as simple as that. The airplane wants to fly itself. Now our airspeed is close to 120 knots, and that works out to about 135 miles per hour as you drive your car on the freeway. And that's not too bad. 
That's about what you'd be doing in a Ferrari. We'll be doing this whole trip in about 45 minutes. It's a lot faster and a lot more fun up here than it would be down there. Okay, now let's finish setting the airplane up for cruise flight. We just need to make some small changes to make sure it's at its most efficient. First, I'll lean the mixture to compensate for the thinner air at this altitude. And I do that by pulling back on the red mixture control. Next, we'll double check the power setting of 2450 RPM. I'll verify that I've done everything by checking the cruise checklist. And there we go. We're set up in cruise flight. And Catalina Island, here we come. So let's talk a little bit about flying straight and level. Now straight means that we're heading in a straight line. We're not turning left or right. And level means level altitude. So let me give you some tips for flying straight and level. Now first, to fly straight, pick a point out in the distance on the horizon and fly toward it. As that point gets closer, pick another point out beyond that. And that's a lot easier than constantly looking down at your heading indicator. Now my second tip for level flight is just memorize what the nose looks like with regard to the horizon. Now you'll notice in this airplane, the nose sits slightly below the horizon in level flight. We can see more over the cowling of the aircraft now than we did in the climb. So match that sight picture anytime and you'll be flying level. Now you can also verify straight level flight with your instruments. But even with all these instruments, the best way to verify straight level is simply look out the window of the aircraft. You see, straight and level isn't all that tough with a little bit of practice. Now let me demonstrate something I think you'll find interesting and reassuring, and that's the natural stability of an airplane. Believe it or not, the airplane wants to fly itself in straight and level flight. Now let me demonstrate that. I'm going to pull the nose up quite a bit above the horizon and then just let go of the controls. Here we go. Okay, now I just let go of the controls and notice that I don't even have my hands on the yoke anymore. So the airplane is really flying itself. You'll see that when I let go, it wants to correct itself back to level without me doing anything at all. See how the nose is going down all on its own? It'll keep going down toward the horizon and it'll go a little too far. But then the airplane's built-in stability will catch that and the nose will compensate and come back up on its own. You can see it coming up now. So it'll come up just a little bit too far and then correct back down again. And you'll see the airplane wants to do this several times, but each time the nose will go up and down a little less and less. It's like the shock absorbers on a car that dampen out the motion. Now after a few of these up and down corrections, the airplane will stabilize itself in straight and level flight all on its own. The fact is, the airplane wants to fly in straight level flight once you have it trimmed, and then all the pilot is doing is just keeping the airplane in line. It really flies itself. It's pretty amazing. All right, you're probably interested in knowing how we're navigating. Without roads or signs, how do we know how to get to Catalina Island in this airplane? Well, there's a couple of ways to navigate, and the most basic is known as pilotage. Believe it or not, pilotage just means we're looking out the window. And before we took off, we took a look at an aeronautical map, which is a kind of map especially for pilots. And we charted our course and looked for landmarks along the way. Now in the air, we find those landmarks along the way and compare them back to our chart. And to back that up and make sure we're on course, some trainers have a GPS unit with a moving map like this one and it uses satellites in Earth orbit to accurately figure out our position. That position is then displayed on a map in the airplane if you have a GPS receiver. And here you can see our exact position overlaid on a map that moves as we move. It makes it pretty difficult to get lost, but not all training airplanes have a moving map GPS. The good news is that there's aviation GPS maps for your mobile devices that you can use to help you navigate. And you'll learn more about GPS navigation and pilotage with your instructor as you continue to train. Today, 
we're just looking out the window and backing up our pilotage with our moving map GPS. It's pretty nice. 3151, contact LA Center 128.6341900, just enemy. So what would happen if you had an engine failure? Well, I'm going to show you very gently what happens just by pulling the power all the way back to idle. So it's about the same as if the engine quit completely. So there we are, the power's all the way back, and you can see what happens. It's not much at all. Just like in our stability demonstration, the airplane flies itself and simply continues to descend. It doesn't dive down or feel like it's falling out of the sky like some people imagine. Most people wouldn't even notice that we're descending. Notice I can take my hands off the yoke and the airplane just gradually descends and continues the descent all on its own. I do need to look for a place to land because I'm coming down whether I like it or not, but it's certainly not an abrupt or dangerous kind of situation. You'll notice I have complete control of the airplane just as I do with the power on. Now let's put the power back on and continue on our way. 125.35, fix my travel. Okay, we're coming up on Catalina Island, so it's time for you and I to start our descent to the runway. We'll just pull the power back with the throttle from our cruise RPM to a descent RPM. And here I'll use about 2200 RPM in the Cessna Skyhawk. And notice what happens. The nose starts down all on its own. The airplane will begin to descend gradually just because I reduce the power. Because the airplane was trimmed, it tries to maintain that same speed as before by lowering its nose and starting a gradual descent as a result. Now all I have to do is enrich the mixture control for the thicker air at lower altitudes and maintain that descent attitude with the nose slightly below the horizon. And the airplane descends all on its own at about 500 feet a minute. It's hands-free flying. Okay, we're getting close to Catalina Island. We're in what we call a stabilized descent to the airport. And that means we're coming down at a constant airspeed and a constant descent rate. And we can confirm that by taking a look at our instruments. Our altimeter says we're descending and our attitude indicator shows our nose is slightly below the horizon. And we can see we're descending right around 400 feet per minute. A nice easy rate of descent. But the best way to confirm we're descending is by looking out the window. We can also look out the window and see that our nose is slightly below the horizon. The airplane is descending and our wings are level. Okay, now let's check in on the recording of the airport weather information on our radio and find out what the conditions are at the airport. Catalina Airport, Avalon, California. Automated weather observation, wind to nine zero at one zero. Visibility one zero. Sky condition clear. We've chosen runway 22 based on the wind direction. Now we always land into the wind to reduce our ground speed as much as we can. The airport on Catalina Island doesn't have a control tower, which is surprising to a lot of people when they first start learning to fly. Thousands of airports across the country don't have control towers, and that's perfectly safe because we learn a methodical and standardized way of approaching an airport. We self-announce our intentions on the radio at specific points in our approach, and we fly a well-practiced pattern to land. We're now about 10 miles away, so we'll make our first radio call. Catalina traffic, Skyhawk 201 Kilo Sierra, 10 miles to the south. We'll be overflying the airport, descending over Twin Harbor, standard the 45 for right traffic, runway 22 Catalina. Now the pattern we'll be flying to land looks like a rectangle around the runway, with the final leg of the rectangle leading to the runway itself. And now would be a great time to do our before landing checklist, and I've got it right here, so let's follow it. Seats and seat belts secured and locked. Fuel selector valve is on both. Mixture control is rich. The landing and taxi light switches are on. The autopilot's off. And the cabin power switch is off. Okay, now everything looks good, and we'll be entering the pattern on the downwind leg of that rectangle we talked about. Now that's the leg that's parallel to the runway, but in the opposite direction of landing. Then we'll turn the base leg, which is 90 degrees perpendicular to the runway. And last, we'll turn the final leg, which is the leg that leads right to the runway. We also need to make sure that we're looking out for other airplanes. It's our responsibility to see and be seen, 
So we've got all our lights on and we're looking around the sky the entire time. Landing is one of the busiest times for a pilot. Now we're coming up on the downwind leg, so I'm going to slow the airplane down just a little bit by pulling power back and pulling the yoke ever so slightly back to maintain altitude. We've completed our landing checklist, and now I'm going to pull the power back a little more. Catalina traffic, Skyhawk 201 Kilo Sierra. It's a two mile 45 for right traffic runway 22 Catalina. And Catalina traffic, Skyhawk 201 Kilo Sierra, turning right downwind runway 22 Catalina. Okay, here we're turning the downwind leg. You'll remember that's the leg that's parallel to the runway, but in the opposite direction. At this point, we're still holding the airplane level at traffic pattern altitude right down till we get to the end of the runway. And the end of the runway is coming up now. So now we're going to start our descent from traffic pattern altitude by pulling the power back and adding 10 degrees of flaps. Now you'll remember that flaps allow us to go down at a steeper angle without building up any airspeed. And we're taking a look at the airport, judging our altitude, making sure that we're staying on a nice downwind leg, continuing to look for traffic all the time. Okay, at this point, we're gonna make our base turn. Catalina traffic, Skyhawk 201 kilos here, turning right base, runway 22 Catalina. And we're continuing our descent. We're gonna add some additional flaps, 20 degrees of flaps, and continue our descent. Okay, there's our base leg. Continuing our descent, watching our airspeed. So we're coming up and turning final so that we'll be right with the runway, adding full flaps, and we'll continue our descent. Catalina traffic, Skyhawk 201 Kilo Sierra, final runway 22 Catalina. All right, on final, we're just watching our airspeed, maintaining a constant airspeed. In this airplane, it's about 65 knots that we're looking for. Adjusting our trim. and judging our height above the runway, and looking for a nice descent angle that'll take us right to the runway. Okay, everything's looking good, our speed's good. Now as we get close to the runway, we're gonna just start a round out so that we fly just above the runway. And as we pull back the rest of our power, and settle down to the runway. And there we go. We're on Catalina Island. Okay, we're coming up to an exit from the runway onto a taxiway, and we're gonna make that turn to the left and exit the runway. And it's a good idea to let the folks know that are also using the airport that the runway is clear. So I'm gonna make an announcement. Catalina traffic, Skyhawk 201 Kilo Sierra is clear runway 22 Catalina. Okay, and now we'll just go ahead bring the flaps up in our after landing checklist. Catalina traffic, Skyhawk 201 Kilo Sierra, taxiing to the ramp from runway 22 Catalina. And that's it. We've shut down the engine, and now we can get out, relax a little bit, and enjoy the beauty of our destination. There's so much to do here, from great restaurants, historic inns, amazing scuba diving, zip lining, and some of the best views around. Even the airport is historic, having been in the Wrigley family's private airfield for many years. Let's go explore. Flying to a destination like this, well, it's almost magical. It's an experience you'll never forget. And it's just one of the many, many amazing experiences you'll have learning to fly and becoming a pilot. Now let's have some lunch. I'm buying.
With lunch completed, we're ready to head back to our home airport. We'll leave Catalina Island and navigate back using the same skills and techniques we used to get here. You and your instructor will practice trips like this often, since going places with your friends and family is what you'll do once you earn your pilot certificate. And after navigating back, we'll make our approach and landing to Montgomery Field the same way we did on Catalina. Well, we're back in San Diego after your very first flying lesson. And this is the time when you and your instructor will review your flight, talk about what you'll work on next time, and maybe give you a homework assignment. You know, earning your pilot certificate involves not just flying skills, but working knowledge about everything from aerodynamics to weather. Of course, King Schools has all the ground school courses you'll need to gain that knowledge and pass your exams with top scores. Now, before we go, let's talk just a little bit about safety. One of the most common questions prospective pilots have is, is flying safe? Well, the answer is complicated, but there's a few things that you'll want to know. First, there's some risk in just about everything we do, including flying an airplane. And your instructor will have the skills to make each flight as safe as possible by teaching you how to identify and manage risks, how to use checklists, and how to make good decisions as a pilot. For example, before your flight today, I went through something called the I Am Safe Checklist. It's a self-assessment tool where each letter in I Am Safe stands for a potential risk to consider before your flight. It helps us recognize those risks before they become a problem. And there are a lot more steps and checklists we go through to manage and reduce the risks of each flight. You'll learn these as you train to become a pilot. They're all part of what we call risk management. And the goal is to be aware of the risks of each flight and to actively reduce them until we're comfortable or we postpone the flight for another time. So I hope you enjoyed our first flying lesson as much as I enjoyed flying with you. Becoming a pilot is an extraordinary journey that opens up a whole new world. It changes who you are and how you see yourself forever. And I hope you'll take the next step. And rest assured, King Schools has the online educational video courses you'll need to impress your flight instructor and pass your tests. A good next step is to download our free book, So You Want to Learn to Fly, and it can be found on kingschools.com. It'll help you chart your course. And as my partners, the legendary John and Martha King, always say, we'll see you at the airport.